You're listening to LVD Podcast Show with your friend, advocate, and host, Alvaro. Hello and welcome to LVD Show. My name is Alvaro and I'm very happy to be with you tonight. So before I introduce our guest, I want to say thank you so much to everyone listening from the United States from Canada, from Australia, from Europe, from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America, and everywhere else where they are listening to the show. Tonight we have someone who is sighted, but he works with people who are visually impaired and blind, especially kids who are studying in college and in high school. They are looking for an internship, and what Jonathan Marine does is he connects them with cultural organizations that offer internships. So this is pretty exciting to hear about. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for being with us tonight. It's my pleasure, Alvaro. We've been building up for this for a couple of months now. You're right, my friend, and it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, it is. All of it was worth it. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, Jonathan, for our listeners, can you tell us a little bit more about you? Sure. So I'm from New York City, born and raised, and never left. Uh, I graduated from Borough of Manhattan Community College around 2004, 2005. And after I graduated, I needed to find some work. And I wasn't sure you know, what type of work was available. So I said, let me see if I could at least become a teacher assistant, because it's actually not that difficult to... Uh, apply for. So I did that, and the first school I went to turned me down because they didn't have uh, any space for me. They were fully staffed. But then about a week later, I got a call from a service agency, and they offered me a job coach position. And I'm assuming they got my information from the school since I was applying uh, for the teacher assistant position. So when I was offered the job coaching position, I really wasn't sure what it was. I had I never heard of it before. It was totally new to me. Uh, then it was explained that I would be dis- uh, like a, a personal supervisor for a disabled person at their work site, and my job will be to help them how to. Well, my my job will be to help them learn how to do the job, but not do the job for them. How interesting. Um- and for our listeners, I have to say the sound quality is really good. Um, mm-hmm. The volume could be a little bit more powerful. Um, so while Jonathan can adjust a little bit more the, the volume maybe of the microphone or or the Skype, um, I, I just want to say that what he's saying about job coaching, and this is the first time I hear that term as such, helping people with disabilities. I think this should be done everywhere in the world because what happens is sometimes, Jonathan and for our listeners, you may be diagnosed with a blinding disease or whatever it may be, and maybe your career has to change. And when it has to change, what are you going to do? Sometimes you're going to need some guidance in this process. So I believe job coaching is wonderful for helping you, in many cases, understand then what? What are you going to do? How are you going to refine your skills what else do you need to learn in order to apply for a job having a good shot of being hired? You know, that's the problem because you need to apply. There's going to be a lot of candidates there. Why choosing you? So the job coaching, I think, is very exciting, very important for society as such. And what is required, Jonathan, for someone to become a job coach for people with disabilities? Usually someone that's already in college 
or uh, while they're in college, they're, they're majoring in maybe in, uh, vocational rehabilitation or orientation and mobility. Now, you made some good points about you know what happens after someone is finished working. That's why a good job coach also plays some sort of a mentorship role, and they they, they help their uh, the consumer that they're working with develop their resume. They help them to learn how to advocate for themselves, teach them how to get to work on time, show them how to get to work. All those little, you know, unofficial things that are not in the job description really come into play. And I have my volume at full blast, so I hope you guys can hear me <laughs> a little bit better. Yes, I, I, I would say so. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, okay, so this is exciting. Now, People are asking, okay, so what is he doing? Can he tell us with which colleges or with which high schools is he working in New York? Yes, I can. So uh, I get most of my students from the New York Institute for Special Education. That's in the Bronx, New York. It's a educational campus made up of about five or six buildings. And it's, it goes from kindergarten all the way to 12th grade, which is high school. And I work with the high school students. However, uh, here in New York City, and this is also true with um, around other cities in the United States, I also have students that are visually impaired that go to public school. And I get some of my students from there as well. So how is the process? Who reaches out for you and how do you work it out <laughs> <laughs> sure so it, it almost goes in a circle so uh usually um the guidance counselors will re reach out to me and, and these are counselors that i've been um i've had relationships with uh for years since job coaching actually so uh, i developed a nice and healthy network so the guidance counselors they get a hold of me they'll let me know that they have a student that is looking for work experience they send me the referral, no, it's like an official referral, so I can get them uh, placed, and then I work with that student. Sometimes a student might share my information with their friends, and their friends would call me up and say, hey, uh, Mr. Marin, I heard you can get me a job. I'm like, okay, yeah, maybe I can, but it's not that easy, and uh, who's calling? <laughs> so uh, that happens sometimes, or you know, there's other times where there's just students that I know and I just might, you know, call or email them and say, hey, you know, do you feel like working this summer? Are you, are you busy? Are you, you know, what, what are your plans? So, you know, it, it, it kind of goes in a circle where we all know each other and everyone reaches out in all different directions. For those listening from outside the United States, can you tell us what is exactly an internship? An internship is a temporary work experience, usually for high school or college students, although there have been some um, organizations that have provide, provided internships to people that have already graduated from college. So the internship is, is really a, it's really a learning work experience, and you're not hired part-time or full-time by that organization, but you can use that internship to try to get you hired. So, if, you know, sometimes if an intern does really well, it leads to part-time or full-time employment. How do you decide which cultural institutions you work with? It all depends where the student lives. So, in New York City, we have five boroughs, the Bronx, Queens, Staten Island, Brooklyn, and Manhattan, right? So... If a student lives and is going to school in Brooklyn, I will try to find an, a cultural institution in Brooklyn that's easy for them to get to. That way they don't have to travel so much. They are traveling um, by public transportation, so they're taking the train or the bus to home or to school. And then after school, they need to take that train or bus to work, and then they got to get back home. So um, depending on the student and their travel skills, I try to keep them as close to home as possible. Some students are really good travelers and they don't mind traveling, you know, from Queens all the way to Manhattan, especially if they're really um, excited about 
their uh, their work site. Now, you say that this um, job coaching um, system, there are some in other parts of the United States. Do you have some kind of uh, network, maybe? Every agency has their own job coaches, and they're very protective because uh, it's they're, they're, job coaching doesn't pay a lot of money. And the hours really aren't consistent, so it, it, it's, it's sometimes it's a part-time job. So whenever an agency has like a couple of job coaches, they try their best to keep those few job coaches. And not only that, not all job coaches, and this is you know an unfortunate reality, they're not all really properly trained to work with someone that might have a disability. So it's really an on-the-job experience, and it was for me. I had to learn sighted guide on the um, do a, a, a one day orientation before I started working with my first student. And Jonathan, if someone would like to become a job coach, what is the process? What do they have to study or do? Well, they they, they can study vocational rehabilitation or orientation and mobility, and you know, once they feel comfortable with that they can find uh, a service agency that works with the disabled and I guarantee you that agency most likely is looking for job coaches especially during the summertime when a lot of work programs are going on. Are there any blind or visually impaired job coaches? I actually thought about doing that myself. I wanted to train some of my oh. students that were uh, visually impaired to be job coaches, but since you have someone, you know, you have an older person that is teaching a younger person how to do the job, that job coach sort of needs to have the advantage of sight so they could really get a full idea of what they're teaching the person that is visually impaired. So if you have one visually impaired person teaching another visually impaired person, it could bring about some difficulty. Oh, I understand what you're saying. Right. I, I, and I, I, but I, I really wanted to do that, but a lot of the counselors were like, no, oh, Jonathan, it, 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 it's great on paper, but it, but, it, but it could be too complicated. And I had, there was a counselor, um, you know, he was totally blind, and he told me, and I quote, don't even think about it. <laughs> so... I was like, all right, man, I tried. I just thought it would be a good idea. He's like, no, no, it's, it's, we shouldn't. We, we really have to get someone with that has a good sight to watch over our kids. So, uh, yeah, but I, I, I did try. I did think it was a good idea at the time. I am thinking, and, and this is the beauty of interviews, um, you, you just think about so many things. Uh, at least oh. it happens to me, not, not to everybody who does interviews, but I have been doing this, Jonathan, for our listeners for over nine years and I have also worked in, in a radio station in, in, in one of the, the biggest in Colombia. So I, I love doing this because it, 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 it allows me to listen and react to what people are saying. You know what I mean? So right. that, that, that's what is exciting to do this to me. And when you talk about what you are doing, helping blind and visually impaired students get ready, so to speak, for a job opportunity, a first job opportunity. Can you give us an example of something that you have done with a student? In terms of uh, getting them ready for work? Yes. Okay, so, you know, yeah, that, that's a great question. So I'll break down the process. So, sure. Yeah, so I, I meet a high school student. Let's just say they're interested in uh, media. And I, I have a student I'm thinking about right now. He was just really talented, uh, visually impaired. He's in college now. He actually goes to the School of Visual Arts. And yeah. he was always into photography. He would walk around with a camera. He would take pictures. He was taking pictures for uh, his school yearbook and, and at, the, at the events at his school. So um, he, wa he, wa you know, he wanted to work, and he wanted something in media. So I said, yeah, okay, I, I, I can help him out. So we met. We spoke for a while over the phone. Um, he, he gave me an idea of what he likes to do, and most importantly, what he already knows how to do. 
because now I can use that to place him at a work site that's going to allow him to utilize his skills. So I found a small media company in the Bronx, and uh, I went over there. I explained the program. I told them all about the student. I showed them uh, his resume. They were impressed. They brought him on, and he was a boom operator. He was doing a little bit of camera work. They had him doing a little bit of everything, and he learned a lot from there. He learned so much that when he went back to school, uh, because he was still in high school at the time, when he went back to his uh, senior year, he ended up doing his own student film. Wow. Then it gets better. (laughs) So um, then that fall, I believe, after he did the film, I got him another internship that was media-related at a, it's a movie theater, it's a one-screen movie theater and cafe, and they needed some, and they just opened up, they were brand new, they had, like, no staff, it was just two people working there, so they needed someone who could, you know, play the movies, control the sound, the color, the brightness, things like that, that student already knew how to do that, so when I met with the, the supervisor at that cinema, I told him all about the student, they brought him on board, and he was he was running the he was running the audio and visual room. Then they said, "Hey, do you have someone that could you know do administration and and, and you know uh, make appointments and take phone calls and take messages and, and at the office?" I said, "Yes." So I found another student. Uh, you no, know, she was into secretarial work, and I got her an internship there. So they basically had like two of my students kind of running the place. You know something that I'm thinking right now, Jonathan? Go ahead. I would like to interview one of them. I could make that happen. Because, um, you know, the show is about raising awareness about what are the abilities, talents, and capabilities of everybody. And to bring on board someone who has participated in such an internship would be very interesting for our young listeners yes and for parents and i want to say that again for parents also you know and i have many parents of blind children and, and kids in in the school that listen to the show and actually i had a parent from texas sending me a message the other day um congratulating me on the show and everything and, and, and that he looks forward to listening to the show that I post every week, and so I think that's something to do. So we'll we'll, we'll talk about that, Jonathan, because I I, I believe it's important, and, and I want to hear their opinions. I want to hear their their challenges they have faced and they have overcome. And you know what? what? I, I have a message for the parents, if you don't mind. Sure. Let your children out. Let them travel. Let teach them how to travel. Get them the services so they can learn how to travel. Don't be afraid. Don't shelter them. There are people with total blindness that take the subways in New York City, the most aggressive city in the world, and they're fine. They're, they're, they, you know, you have people with no vision. They're, they're flying on airplanes. They're, they're, they're traveling the country. Let your children out. Let them work. Let them explore. Jonathan, if our listeners... Our listeners know that I have um, not only worked in, in New York, but I have been on the subway hundreds of times. And the subway in New York is interesting. That's all I'm <laughs> going to say. Um, yes, it is. <laughs> but but um, if I'm able to make it happen there with my cane, everybody is going to be able to make it happen as well. And the attitude is everything, my friends. So I agree a hundred percent with Jonathan and Jonathan. Um, something two two questions in in one because they are in in a bit related. One is, is there any difference between volunteering and doing an internship? Yeah, I believe volunteering uh, you do not get paid. Internships you can get paid, and do internships you could also get college credits, depending on um, the, the the job site, of course, and if the school allows it. Okay, okay. And the other one is, when you go to a cultural institution, you sit down with them, you said, I 
show them the resume of the kid. My question is, if they don't have any job experience, how do you do that? That's when I got to get creative and let them know that this student is really interested in, you know, uh, this particular subject. Let's give them a chance. It's only for a couple of months. They are getting paid through my organization. I would just like for you to give them the work experience. We'll communicate weekly and you let me know how things are going. And this is a great opportunity for, you know, for your institution to, to, to really teach someone and, uh, you know, open their eyes and give them a chance and let them grow. And tell me, I'm sure most organizations are excited about trying this out, but there must be some that say maybe not or we are scared about it. Can you tell us about that? I've been doing this for six years and only once did I get the impression that an organization that that particular organization was just not interested. I remember I called them up. Uh, I was talking about my program. I let them know that the student is really into music and you know he's visually impaired. And the man I was speaking to on the phone really said with a chuckle and he laughed. He said, Well what could he really do? And when he said that I, I, I was very angry, but I, I kept my cool. I just said, okay, right. thank you. Um, you know, maybe next time. And then I ended the call because I already knew, one, he wasn't interested, and two, if the student ended up going there, he probably wasn't going to be treated right. Um, yes. However, yeah, it, it's, it's, I don't think it's luck. Um, it's just that I think a lot of organizations that I talk to, they like the idea of my program, the Career Discovery Project. They like the fact that they're getting some extra help from some young, hungry, and academic students that want any work experience, and they're flattered that they want that work experience with that particular organization. Um, now, sometimes, of course, not every institution says yes. Maybe they're fully staffed, and they don't um, have the room to host an intern, and that's fine. And, I, I, you know, doing it this long, I know when they are sincere about that because sometimes they might call me up a couple months later and they'll say, hey, do, do you still have an intern available? I'm like, yeah, sure. And then, you know, we'll start all over again. This is exciting. Okay, more questions that come to mind. <laughs> Keep them coming. All of them. I want them all. <laughs> <laughs> well, the next one is when you go to an organization and you say, okay, so this kid has these skills and he would like to have this opportunity, and the organization says yes. My question is related to accommodations, meaning maybe screen readers for the computer, or maybe have some changes in the space of the facility. I don't know. I'm, I just would like to know how does that work for the student to feel comfortable there? Right. So sometimes the, uh, you know, during my interview with the institution, yeah, they'll, they'll ask me if this particular student needs any adaptations, and I would already know what that student might might need. So when I do my screening with the student, I'll ask them straight up because I have to. Like, look, do you need anything in large print? Do you need any lights right. dimmed? Um, you know, uh, do you have how much usable vision do you have, and so on. And I only ask these personal questions so I can make sure they're going to be put in a good position to succeed. So when I, I when I then when I you know with that information I, I pass it along uh, you know to the person I'm, in, I'm I'm speaking with at the uh, cultural institution and you know we, we meet right in the middle and, and they're fine providing them with whatever help they will need but I also tell my students when you go to that job interview or you know you're, you're when you're at your orientation you need to advocate for yourself and let them know that you might need. Um, some changes to the computer, or whatever it is. Maybe you need to bring your magnifier to work. Let them know you're going to bring it and you're going to use it. Let them know that this room might be too bright. See if they'll lower it for you, or at least maybe they'll let you wear your sunglasses or uh, or a hat to cover the glare. So I have, you know, I, I teach my students to advocate for themselves because if they don't, no one's going to help them. They're just going to sit there. Yes. And then they're not going to yes, do. Yes, absolutely. I had a and student. Jonathan, let's yes. Go ahead. 
No, no, please, please, go on. Oh, I, I was going to give an example. I, I had a student one time. Um, he was working at a small tech company, and he had a he, he had a laptop. He, he was using their laptop actually, and you know he would look really close to the screen. And the woman over there, she was so sweet, so nice. And she asked him, look, would you like us to make it bigger? And he was being really stubborn about it. He was being really stubborn, and he kept saying no. But she knew he really needed the help. So she called me. I had a, I had a talk with him, and, you know, he got over it, and he started enlarging the screen size, and then he was fine. So some of them, you know, you, you got to push them a little bit, and uh, you, you kind of have to play that big brother role. Let's say the student needs Zoom text. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that program? I'm familiar with Zoom text and JAWS. And if they need it, they usually get it from their uh, representing uh, service agency through their counselor. And then the job site will allow them to install it on their computers. Ah, perfect. Yeah. How about transportation? How, how, how does that work? Because they they are um, on their age, right? Oh, no, they're, they're high school students. So they're, you know, they're 15, 16, 17 years old. And they're, they're, they, they take the subways to school. They take the buses to school. And they take them to work. But what I do is I teach them the route. So if they're leaving from school to the work site before they start work, I will meet them at their school. And then we'll go over the route. And I'll actually take them to the job site and show them how to get there. Wow, this is so exciting. I, well, it gets I more exciting, Alvaro, because there's some students that, you know, they're just so used to traveling, they'll just tell me, hey, Mr. Merritt, just tell me what train goes there, and I know how to get there, and then I'll do that. Although, i got to make sure they actually know. <laughs> so, But, yeah, you know, they're just <laughs> some, as, as you know, uh, there's some students that are more independent than others. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And... Do you have some kind of stats about how many end up working maybe for that organization? Uh, well, I had two students uh, that, well, actually one student, he just got hired uh, for a part-time position uh, in January. He was working at the very cool Museum of the Moving Image. And if anybody visits New York, you guys have to go there. It's very cool. Uh, he was he was interning there through my program from September through December. He was working in their education department, and he's a college student, by the way, and he did very well. So when the internship was over, they offered him a part-time position, and now he is working there in their education department. And I'll ask for stats. I don't have an exact number. I've been doing this uh, for six years, and sometimes students are, like, in and out. So it's, it's hard to keep track, but I could say about four or five have gone on to full-time employment, maybe not at the particular site, but they were able to go out and get a job on their own, which is just as good. That's wonderful. And tell us, not to go sidetrack of the conversation, but what is this museum you're recommending? <laughs> the Museum of the Moving Image is in the story of Queens. And it, it's all about the history of uh, film and movies. It's it, a film and movie. It, it's, it's great. Uh, if you go there, they have a whole uh, Jim Henson ex exhibit. So you'll see um, all the Muppets like Kermit and Miss Piggy. Uh, they have a horror movie section. So you'll see. Really? Yeah, you, you, you'll, you'll see models of Freddy Krueger and Michael Myers. It's so oh. cool. They have all the old cameras, oh. things like that. Um, so the student, actually, that that's working there now... It, he was one of that that I ended up featuring um, in the book that I'm working on. It, it was just the, the photos came out great because of the museum setting. So uh, it, it's it's a really great place. Oh wow! I didn't know about that museum. Yeah, the Museum of the Moving Image. Now the the woman, uh, excuse me, the woman that that, I, that um, works over there at their education apartment. Uh, her and I have been friends for a long time. So it's like whenever she like works at a different institution, she calls me up and she asks for an intern. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> she knows I'm going to send her somebody good. Right, right, right. In in talking about these, Jonathan, are you thinking of expanding to other cities or states? 
it will not be easy because I, I, I run the program, but it's not mine. Uh, no, it's 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 it within the nonprofit that I work for. Uh, if I wanted to expand the program, we would definitely need you know, some. We would need more grants, and we would need bigger staff. Uh, but I'm, I'm always up for like consulting uh, uh, others that want to emulate the program because I, I would love to see it expand in that way. In fact, that would be the most possible way for this program to expand. Now, our listeners may be thinking, okay, this is a wonderful program. Now, if the person listening is over 40, mm -hmm. it's a different ballgame. I know Correct. that. But what do you recommend to them? I recommend that they, because they do have agencies, uh, especially within the United States, that they um, are familiar with people 30s and 40s that need work, and they have particular programs for those people. They just have to go out and search for them because they do exist. Now, you talk a little bit about your book. Can you explain what's the name of the book? Is it available, and what are we going to find there? The name of the book is See Us. It's a photographic journey of six visually impaired young adults from New York City that are balancing their lives between work, home, and school. So it's a photography book, black and white photos, beautiful photos, and it's giving the reader um, a look into the lives of these particular students. They're all from different boroughs of New York City. They're all different nationalities, and they all have their own uh, background story, and when the, the book will be out in May, it should be coming out sometime in May. I, I promise I'll keep everybody updated. And we're we're almost done. So uh, accompanying each photo is a blurb of the student's personal thoughts. So we also get to read what the student was thinking at that time while they were working or while they were home or whatever feelings were you know, going through their mind at that time. I wanted to make it personal for everyone. Very interesting book. It's, it's important to have those kinds of books because you are teaching a lot in there for society, I believe, and also for parents that they don't know the beauty that the kids have inside and, and, and they have to let it be you know because sometimes as you say they they are very very scared of what my kid is gonna do blah 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 but they need to go on and live life i have a student in the book she's amazing she's colorblind uh but she's still a graphic artist because you know, she's very smart so what she did she remembers the color codes from when she has to do her graphic arts and so her mother is also legally blind. Wow. Yeah, so uh, she, you know, her and her mom are absolutely amazing. Um, her pictures came out great. Her mom has been very helpful um, through the whole thing, letting us in her home to, uh, to photograph them. It, 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 was, uh, it was a great experience. Jonathan, have you worked with kids that speak Spanish? Uh, no, most of my students are bilingual. Okay. okay yeah, and, and, uh, and, yeah, guys, sorry, I, I, I don't speak Spanish. I should speak Spanish. Uh, I can understand some of it, um, but I, I, yeah, I, I cannot speak it back, unfortunately. But I always love when my students speak Spanish because, as you know, being bilingual, it, it, it's very useful and it's very marketable yeah. to employers. It doesn't matter. Right, I have right. students that speak Mandarin. I have students that speak Chinese. I mean, really? uh, that speak Spanish. Yeah, they speak Mandarin. They speak Spanish. Because remember, my, my my internship program it covers the whole city. And if you know right. New York, every neighborhood is like a whole no, different world. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, now, if someone, if if a kid wants to dream very very big and says, mm -hmm. you know what, I would like to work. I mean, well, 
work in the future, but start an internship at, let's see, maybe NBC, or let's see, maybe CBS, or maybe Fox News, or maybe CNN. Can they tell you that, Jonathan? Can they say, give me that, or give me McDonald's, and, and you try to make it happen, or how does it work that way? Well, I will never give them McDonald's, but I will give them <laughs> NBC if I could. <laughs> and it's, it's all I have to do is just find a, the right connection in the office. I have to make sure that the student at least has some, uh, you know, maybe the student is you know, slightly exceptional and they can handle that type of work because we got to be realistic. Uh, the, the bigger the organization, the more they're going to expect from a student. That's so right. that's right. And, you know, and it's, it's funny you mention those organizations because this summer I'm getting one of my students an internship with HBO Sports. Oh, wow. He has a great story. Um, well, I don't know if great's the right word, but he used to be, he used to have perfect vision. And he was a high school basketball player here in New York City. He was extremely talented, well scouted, and he was ranked very high, right? He ended right. up losing most of his vision to the point where he couldn't play anymore. So instead of having his head down and getting depressed, you know, this kid has a lot of confidence and he still wants to be involved in sports somehow. So I said, all right, come to my program and I'll keep him involved. So right now we're, uh, we're pretty much finalizing uh, his internship this summer with HBO Sports because he would like to see if he can transition over to broadcasting. Incredible. Yeah, I, I, he's another one that I, I have featured in my book. I'm telling you, the, the kids in there, their, their, their stories are they're, they're really something. No. It's easy to say that when you watch the news and you read papers and you go through social media post, everybody's complaining about the unemployment rate mm -hmm. for people with disabilities in general. What's your thoughts? Uh, I mean, especially about unemployment in, well, let's say in, 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 in big cities, um, not only in, in rural areas, which I know is harder. Oh, I can imagine. Oh, my gosh. Transportation. But, but still, in, in places like New York, I mean, I have a, a very good friend, Marco, <laughs> who also, I'm sure, is, is listening right now. Um, and he was telling me, the unemployment rate is, is very big, despite the fact that we have the ADA turning 30 years mm -hmm. this year. So what is happening with that, and why is that still a problem? It's a factor of a bunch of things, uh, not in any particular order, but it, and some parents may not like this. It starts at home. If you're sheltering your child and you're not letting them out, they're not going to have the confidence to go and look for work, and they're not going to develop any job skills. It's that simple. Secondly, I think some of these employers, they're just afraid. They don't know how to work with someone with a disability, especially since there, there's so many out there. They're afraid they might say the wrong thing. They might offend a person. They might be afraid to uh, you know, put them in a position to fail. They um, could also have some ignorance, and they might just think, you know what, this person has a disability. They won't be able to do this job. So uh, it, it's just a factor of uh, a bunch of things combined. And it's too bad. Um, we could hope that with, you know, organizations like mine and, and, and others slowly start to bring down those numbers. But it, it's also on the disability community as well. Because I, I met a lot of students, they just had no interest in working in my program. They wanted to stay home and, you know, play video games all day. Or, or they just weren't interested in working. And eventually, that's going to come back to haunt them. Jonathan, I, I have to to add something to what you're saying. And, and, and I said that to Marco on the interview that is going to be posted in, 
Oh, last please. thing, please. I'm sorry, because this is another that, that drives me nuts. They also expect everyone to help them. That's not realistic. You have gotta go out on your own. You gotta advocate for yourself. Absolutely. So my my comment is this, and 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 I know it's controversial. What, what I'm going to say is controversial, but mm-hmm. it, it's is what I feel. You know what can I say? I mean, let's face it. The famous disability check, whatever is the official name okay. of it, SSI. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is available in the United States, in Canada, in the UK, in in some other uh, of the developed countries. Mm-hmm. Um, I wonder how that system is working. And, and what I'm trying to say is many people in the blind community, they could work, but they are at home watching Judge Judy. And nothing mm-hmm. against Judge Judy. <laughs> but it, it's just a, a way to to put it. I do believe the system is not working right because the problem I, I, I find is that if you tell someone, listen, you don't need to work because we're going to give you this check that is going to help you a little bit and then your parents are going to help you the rest or whatever, mm-hmm. maybe, your, maybe your spouse or whatever. So they become lazy at it and yes. they become yeah they become dependent on that and the problem with that jonathan in my view as a person who is legally blind is that's the image some people are going to get from us you know because if, if if they find you at mcdonald's and say oh what are you doing no i don't work why i don't need to yeah but you could no i'm blind so they start to think, oh, so blind people are not able to walk. Mm-hmm. So that's something I have against the system, because if the system would work well, when you have a severe disability, maybe you are deafblind and you have more issues, because I know many people in the deafblind community working and working fine. So, But if you have severe disabilities and you have uh, a mental uh, problem that is very complicated to deal with and you definitely are not able to work, then I understand that there's so many people right now maybe even listening and saying oh my god, maybe he's right (laughs) I should look for work because I have a dignity and I have a way to earn some money if I wanted to but I choose not to try to because society is giving me the chance not to so I'm a little bit concerned about Jonathan that people can become lazy if the government, instead of analyzing every case very carefully, they say blind, get it, wheelchair user, get it, blah blah blah, and that's not helping the blind community or the disability community. Absolutely right. Uh, I, I think a lot of people they get very comfortable getting that. 700 sometimes 900 dollars a month and mm. they're not paying a lot in rent because they might be living in uh supportive housing or they're living with their parents so they're like yeah why yeah. the heck would i work this is yeah. great i'm getting free money every month you know um i i remember i i, I had this uh back when i was job coaching actually and i had a student quit he said no nah, i just want to you know get the ssi i was like Dude, but come on, you, you're you're really ruining a great chance here. You want to get SS get paid once a month, or you want to get paid twice a month, right? You know, so yeah, it's it's just uh, it, it's just a, uh, a way of thinking that some of them have, and it's too bad. And you're right. I, I think if what what SSI should be doing or Social Security, they should be saying, hey, if you want this money to keep coming, you should be able to work. If you can't work will help you. But if you can work, we'll help you along the way and you can still get paid. Because SSI is kind of a trap also, because if you make so if you make too much money, um I believe it's over two thousand a month here in New York City or something like that, then they start to penalize you and they'll take your money away and then they make you pay it back. So um I, I'm not sure how it works, but it, it, it does kind of it's kind of a catch twenty two. Uh mm-hmm. if you heard that expression before that happens yeah. sometimes. 
um, they, they they should fix that. But yeah, I, I, on the other on the other hand, there are just a lot of people that they're just happy and they're just content with the the way things are now. It's just very easy for them. Yeah, and, and, and the reason I mentioned the Jonathan and for our listeners, I, I want to be clear about it, is because I I know how capable we are. As simple as that. Yeah. You know, so I like it. I do not like it when I hear people staying at home when they could be working, paying the bills, and being independent. I don't like. It. I don't. I, I think we are better than that. I'm yeah, sorry. And, you know, and especially here in New York City, and because I, I and I'm only saying this out of experience, because I have come across these, uh, you know, some of these parents and this is what this, their, my, my consumers have told me, their parents want them to keep getting that SSI so they can get some of that money. And it's, oh. you know, it's terrible, but that's just how it is, you know. I mean, there's no other way to, to phrase that. Yes, and I would prefer not to comment on that miserable mm-hmm. way of being yeah. <laughs> for yeah. some people. There's everything in these planet Earth, as our listeners know. But to end this wonderful talk, Jonathan, what are your final thoughts? I just want, you know, to let everyone know that there's great work programs out there for for your children and for you if you're old enough to search on your own. You just got to, you know, use the Internet. All the information is at your fingertips. Find them. Find something you like. Let people help you. Don't be don't be ashamed. Uh, you know, to take to, to to get any help. There's there's nothing wrong with that. Um, my program in particular, it's uh, it's not making dreams come true, but it's getting them started. I'm giving a lot of opportunities to students that wouldn't have had these opportunities otherwise, and um, I'm I'm just very excited. I'm, I think I'm in a really good place right now. I love what I'm doing, and I want to keep doing it as long as possible. Uh, again. That's kind of why I did this book, so people could see this, you know, forever. That these are the type of students that are out there. This is what the blind and visually impaired can do. Uh, there's nothing that can stop you if you put your mind to it, and if you allow some people to help you along the way. Very well said, Jonathan. And finally, how can people get in touch with you if they wish? Sure. So uh, you can follow me on Instagram at see us book on twitter author underscore marin that's m-a-r-i-n or you can email me at marin m-a-r-i-n one two seven eight one at gmail.com uh see us will be out in may there should be a website coming soon you'll be able to order um from the website and uh, with them out getting on Amazon and in bookstores, and I want to give it uh, a really big push. Well, Jonathan, it's been a privilege to have you on. I am so excited. I, I have to say for listeners, I had some questions here, but <laughs> I chose to ask other questions that I had on my mind as we were mm-hmm. talking. This is beautiful. I hey, we'll it. do this again, man. Just call me. We'll do this again. I, I'm totally cool with it. <laughs> yeah, it's so exciting. <laughs> in, in Jonathan, you are a great guest, and I love your attitude about life, my friend. Yes, sir. This was uh, this was actually my first podcast, so uh, this is a, this was a great experience for me. I'm glad it was with you. This was a lot of fun, and um, yes, you, you and I have some unfinished business, and we'll be talking more. And uh, thank you, thank you so much. My pleasure, Jonathan. And for our listeners, remember always to smile and. If you want to be on the show, remember you can email me at lowvisionbureau at gmail.com or you can also follow me on Twitter at Low Vision Bureau. So this is Alvaro from LVB Show saying good night.